Iowa basketball takes another bad loss, this time on the road to Nebraska, 66-50. We react and look to the future of Iowa hoops for this season, and the future does not appear to be very bright. A whole lot of things to work on on the Iowa men's basketball front. We'll talk about that. We got a bowl game to preview. That's right, as we're a day away from kickoff and the finale for the Hawkeyes as they take on Kentucky from Nashville and Gary Barta and the University of Iowa Athletic Department sent out an email talking about Iowa Swarm. Are fences being mended? We'll get into that today on Locked On Hawkeyes. Our Locked On Hawkeyes, your daily podcast on the Iowa Hawkeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, welcome in. This is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen each and every day. We're available wherever you get podcasts. You can also watch us on YouTube. Help us out. Hit that subscribe button. Helps us get in front of more Hawkeye fans. And also, if you're on the podcast side, we're looking for five-star ratings. Help us out. And we try to get in front of more Hawkeyes out there. Today's episode of the Lockdown Hawkeyes podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Well, if you've been following my picks, we've been hot. And I was on Nebraska here tonight, not to rub it in in any fashion, because that was an absolute stinker as Iowa falls 66-50 to Nebraska. Is Nebraska better than a year ago? Sure. Does that matter? It's still a bad basketball team. Incredibly frustrating the way this one played out. Freya McCaffrey's squad, after the awful effort that they had against Eastern Illinois, you get Chris Murray back, you get Connor McCaffrey back, and you anticipate, at minimum, this gonna, team's going to come out. They're going to play inspired. They're going to be tough. They're they're going to be ready to go. That wasn't the case. Now, basketball is an incredibly difficult sport, regardless of level, when you're not hitting shots. And this team had a drought, something we've never seen before in the Fran McCaffrey era. It was bad. There's no two ways about it. The offensive system just was absolutely broken. Guys were not able to hit shots. And it leads to a big picture question about this squad. That's one thing to have a bad night. That's going to happen. Over the course of a 33-game season, you're going to have bad nights. You're going to have those nights where your shots aren't falling. But the thing that is incredibly frustrating about this team and about the way this roster has been built is this is not a one-off. This is not one thing that you look at and say, well, they just had a bad night shooting the ball. They're going to be okay. We know year after year, Fran McCaffrey's teams are going to be good offensively. And that is the case overall in college basketball again this year. Iowa uh, currently, even after this game, at Kemba Pomeroy and his efficiency numbers have them 20th in the country in offensive efficiency. They're fine on that front. But those numbers pale in comparison to what we've seen where every year this has been a top 10 team offensively for the most part of the McCaffrey era. So you have that component. And now you couple it with this team that's not shooting the ball well. We know that shooting coming into the year was going to be a question mark, right? That there were going to be questions about the shooting with this team. You lose Bohannon off of last year's team. You lose shooting that you've had in the past with, obviously, Keegan Murray. You lose a couple of guys like that. And, and the questions were, outside of Chris Murray, who was going to be the guy that was going to be able to knock down shots? And the anticipation, it was going to be Peyton Sanford. Uh, Peyton Sanford right now is unplayable. He plays nine minutes. He goes 0 for 9. He has struggled mightily. Since the first two games of the year, he has not been able to get it going. And with that, he doesn't do enough else to help you. Patrick McCaffrey can hit shots, but he's not doing enough outside of that. And he was not good tonight to do it. Just look at the numbers here that you got in this game where he put 50 up against Nebraska. Yeah, better defensively, but come on. 50 points for a McCaffrey coach team. It's not good enough. For Bracha, he's out there. He goes 8 to 16 from the floor. He was fine. 6 of 15 out of Chris Murray. Fine. And then a 1 for 9 from Patrick McCaffrey. Tony Perkins, rough. Absolutely rough. But as rough as my voice. <laughs> rough. Perkins, over 5 from 2. Hits the 3 late in the game. 
He finishes one of six. 0 for 4 from Aaron Euless, including hitting the side of the backboard on a three-point attempt. Connor, he's out there. He's 2 of 8, including 1 of 6 from downtown. DeSante Bowen's 0 for 4. And then the aforementioned Peyton Sanford. Now, I would love to just chalk this up to that. It was just a bad night. But there was so much more here. This was being out tough, out physical, the laissez-faire attitude that you saw out of this group. And, and my hope and my anticipation with this group, yeah, this is not one of the deeper teams that Fran has had, but it felt like they had the right mix of dudes, guys that would be out there. There was going to be some kind of toughness factor. You know, the defensive backcourt that you had with Tony Perkins, coupled with Aaron Euless, that they were going to be able to do some things defensively that they were going to be all right. They were going to be better on that end of the floor, and it was going to translate. That's not the case. Yeah, Aaron Euless, he's not a good offensive player. Now, you wonder now, they've tried a bunch of different things at this point. And, and is it time to get Connor out there, who at least plays hard? I mean, say all the negatives you want about Connor, and, and he's heard them all, and we've heard them all. And I disagree with everybody in those negatives that you come out with him. But the dude plays hard. He's an incredibly smart player. I, I, I think there's not some guy that's sitting down on the bench right now that, oh, it's all, that's going to figure it out, right? Desante Bowen, does he got a future? I think so. But it's not right now. If you believe this team is going to be an NCAA tournament team, I would call you crazy. I mean, the, the performances we've seen over the last week, that's the team that's not even making the NIT the way that they played for a week now. I mean, not even close. Losing to one of the worst teams in college basketball in Eastern Illinois and then one of the worst teams of the Big Ten. Yeah, you're not even making the NIT. You're playing like this. But here is going back to last year. Tony Perkins, when he was playing his best at the end of the season, he was inserted in the starting lineup. They moved Bohannon back to the point guard position. Joe Toussaint went to the bench. And when they did that, it was not just Bohannon run the point. He did that plenty. But even when Iowa played their best basketball right at the end of the season throughout the Big Ten tournament, it was Bohannon and Tony Perkins working together in that backcourt. Well, Connor's not tonight, but overall has been shooting the ball well. Can you couple Connor and Tony Perkins together Maybe take a little bit of the pressure off of Tony Perkins also doing that. You go with those two guys up there. Obviously, Chris Murray, he's a starter. Rebracha's out there. You go that route and see what you got. You got to get more out of Patrick McCaffrey. You, he can't just be a guy that when things are going well, he can score 15 a game. Get on the boards. Do more. Show some effort on the defensive end. After giving up 92 to Eastern Illinois, and, and some of the same things happen. I get it. This team's not going to be great defensively. It's not the way that this program is built. But the frustration of seeing this attitude that's showing up with this team right now, is it a lost team? Is it a lost season? For Iowa to dig themselves out of the hole now, 0-2 in the Big Ten, one of the worst losses in college basketball against Eastern Illinois. It's not good enough to be 500 in the Big Ten now. 10-10 and 10 is not going to be enough in the Big Ten to be an NCAA tournament team without a deep run in the Big Ten tournament. It's just not going to happen. And, and with that loss and how bad it was, and we talked about it a week ago after losing to Eastern Illinois, I don't think 11-9. and nine. That means you got to go at minimum, at minimum 12-8 and eight in the Big Ten, and they're 0-2. Oh, and by the way, this is what is up next for this Hawkeye team. Another road trip this weekend, they go to Penn State, the most experienced team in college basketball. That's who they face next. Then Indiana. They get them at home. They're now an underdog in that game. And then you go to Rutgers. And we know a very difficult place to play. Then you come home for Michigan and Michigan State. But here it is. It's as simple. Sunday against Penn State is as close to a must win as you're going to have on January 1st as you could possibly think about. That, that's where this team is. That's the kind of hole that they dug themselves. So if you believe this is a tournament team, and I believe all season long, even after the Eastern Illinois game, I still I still thought there was a chance that they could be a tournament team. This effort, it's not losing the game. It was the fashion that it happened. Iowa right now, in all college basketball, all 360 teams, whatever it is, they are, in three-point shooting, 237. 32% from three. They can't shoot. When you're an offensive team and you can't shoot, that's not a great combination. Thank you, Professor Condon. We're going to take a quick time out here, come back on the other side. We got lots more to get into. Iowa basketball, a frustrating night. Hey, tip of the ball cap to the ladies. They got it done against Purdue. Another great performance out of uh, the crew there. Caitlin Clark, she was going off. 
Monica Zano and company. Really, really nice win for them. As uh, Purdue got back into it a little bit, I think cut it to, what, seven at one point, something like that in the second half. But ultimately, I was able to gain control again and run away with the victory. They got another one uh, coming up this weekend as they will head to Illinois trying to continue their undefeated start of the Big Ten. We'll get into the bowl game. Iowa tomorrow gets ready for their matchup against Kentucky. Final news and notes, Spencer Petrus is coming back. Well, kind of. We'll explain that to you. And Gary Barta and the Hawkeye Swarm Collective, maybe some mending of the fences. We'll get into that on the other side here as we roll through. This is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Today's episode of the Lockdown Hawkeyes podcast is brought to you by NHTSA. You've been hanging out with your friends, putting back a few drinks. A few becomes a few too many. As the evening comes to an end, people start to head out. You're thinking about calling for a ride, but you live nearby. You think you can make it home okay, no big deal. What are the odds you're going to get pulled over anyway? And even so, what's the worst that could happen? There's a lot. Insurance goes up, lose your license, lose your job, told to your car, you can kill someone. Everyone knows about the risk of drunk driving. The results are tragic and often deadly. However, that doesn't stop everyone from getting behind the wheel while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on our roads to save lives. So if you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, think again. Play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. Trent Cotta back with you on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen each and every day. Looking for those five-star ratings on the podcast side and hit the subscribe button as uh, we work to get to the 2,000 number. That's what we're looking to get to here as uh, we get our way through through college basketball and keep hitting that subscribe button. Always greatly appreciate it as we get in front of Hawkeye fans. As we roll through here, basketball frustrating. Let's hope we don't have more frustration tomorrow on the football field. Look, the expectations going into this game, it's going to be a slugfest. 30 and a half is the number. Now we're getting the weather reports from Nashville. It appears that there's going to be some rain in the forecast. That doesn't make things any easier for the offenses. And a slippery football, a couple new quarterbacks, one for Kentucky, one for Iowa, as we'll see Joe Labus get the start. You know, there are intriguing parts to this game. And as we've really started to dive in this week, look, it, it was hard the opening of the transfer portal, the rematch against Kentucky. It, it was too, it was difficult to get too excited. And of course, the way the regular season came to an end, and losing in that fashion to Nebraska on the football field was also incredibly frustrating. So you have that component of it. But now as we're here, I'm excited to see if there is truly anything, even in a backup role next season, to Joe Labus just to see what he can do. You know, we've heard about him run around. We heard back in 2021 a lot about him on scout team. And this is going to be a different guy and something to get excited about. All right, I want to see him. We're hearing that they're implementing some RPO stuff. And maybe we're going to see a little bit of a evolution of the offense, at least for this bowl game and possibility of that going forward. I want to see Deontay Vines out there to see, you know, a couple of moments that he had after he came back from the wrist injury. If this is something that you know can be a guy that's going to be a piece of the offense going into next season. Do we get to see Jacob Bostic out there at wide receiver? Do we get to see him a, a little bit more? How about Jennings Dunker at the guard position? Really banged up this year, listed as a starter. If he's a guy that you can feel maybe helps solidify the guard position next season for this Iowa team that has to be a whole lot better up front. We get to see Xavier Wampa out there, and it looks like he's going to get the start for the first time in his career. Maybe take what we saw a year ago. Cooper DeGene, of course, got the start in the bowl game and what that developed and turned into for him. So there are things to get excited about. There are some things to get you pumped up. Plus, you get to see the black and gold out in the field, right? One final time. It's It's got to fire you up. If you're a Hawkeye fan and you're listening and watching it right now, of course you are. Uh, there, there's no doubt that is something also that just gets you fired up one more time. We can be disappointed. We can want to see change. We can want to see evolution, but it's still the black and gold, right? And because of that, there's a certain level of excitement that's always going to be there. I know for me, regardless of what sport it is, what game you're playing, how good, how bad a team is, 
There's always something about just the Tiger Hawk, seeing them out there, seeing them, the pads pop and everything else that gets you fired up and gets you excited. So there are some components here. Now, how's this thing play out, right? We, we've talked earlier in the week with LaShawn, got his thoughts on, on things and how things are going to break down. I see it this way. I, I do think that Iowa, with the opt-outs on both sides, that they are the better team. That that what is left for Iowa compared to what is left for Kentucky, that the Hawkeyes have an advantage. How much are they willing to let Joe Labus do? How much are they willing to open up this offense? Or is it very much going to be an old school fairness game? We we as Hawkeye fans certainly love the six four game from two thousand four a lot more. I know than the national media does. That, that was a thing of beauty, right? Two safeties. Kirk had just lost his dad, an incredibly emotional week, the way that played out against Penn State and, and winning in that kind of fashion in a game where you take a safety where a field goal beats you, but you believe in your defense that much and you hold on to win that football game. Are we trending to 6-4? Possibly. <laughs> I mean, it, would I be shocked if that's what we see? I, I really wouldn't. I, that's, Kentucky has their set of issues, but... When you look at two offenses that aren't going to do a whole lot, and if neither team makes that huge mistake, or not even a big mistake, because I could see both teams certainly doing that, a multitude of mistakes, though. One team turns it over four or five times, and you get three interceptions, you put it on the turf a time or two, all of a sudden this thing craters, as we saw from Iowa in the Ohio State game. Short of something like that happening, the one part where Iowa has the biggest advantage is in special teams. Better kicker, a lot better punting game, return game's good. And also think back to bowl games. Akron Wadley in the Boston College game at the Pinstripe Bowl. He had a big kick return in that one. Beating USC in the Holiday Bowl. That was Amir Smith-Marset returning a kick for a touchdown. LeVar Woods with some extra time to prepare. Maybe even a gadget play in there or two. And something a little bit different. Possibility. We could see that come out. And Iowa has an advantage there. And though Kentucky's defense is pretty good, it's not the Iowa defense. So, Huge advantage on the special team side. An advantage defensively. Both teams are going to be out there playing a different quarterback. Now, I am a little bit concerned about the new Kentucky quarterback. He was a big recruit coming out of Tennessee, uh, beat some big-time programs to get his services. He can move around. He can run around. And we've seen those kind of quarterbacks have give Iowa's defense some trouble in the past. So that's my one pause where I'm all in that I really love Iowa to win this game. I, if you've been listening here for a while to Lockdown Hawkeyes, or if you hear me on the radio every day on KXNO, you know, I am not the most optimistic sports fan out there, and I'm certainly not an optimistic Hawkeye fan. I, I just not. Not my DNA. I guess I got too much scar tissue, whatever it is. It's just not my way. But I, I feel relatively confident here. Not all the way in. I'm not diving head first. I'm, I'm dipping the toe in. I think I was the better side. I think they're going to find a way to get this thing done. Point spread's been moving around. Iowa has uh, been anywhere from well, opening a underdog in this game. They've been between a one and two and a half point favorite here throughout the week as we get closer to kickoff. 11 a.m. tomorrow, we will see exactly where that number is. But I was going to go off as a favorite. I like the under in this game. Let's say the Hawkeyes get it done, though. Let, let's go something crazy here. Like, let's say 12-9, 13-10, 15-11. Five field goals. I could buy that. It's going to be something a little wacky. Maybe there's going to be a safety in there. Maybe a couple. Regardless, I like Iowa, and I think they're going to get it done. We're going to wrap up here on Locked On Hawkeyes. Oh, also, one more note here from my notes on the Spencer Petras front. So I teased it uh, going into the break, and Spencer Petras, according to the reports down there, he is going to stay with the Iowa program, at least through the spring. So Torn Laburn, also rot a rotator cuff injury for him. He's going to be out as much as out to 11 months. So that means even if he wanted to play another season, it was going to be incredibly difficult for him to do that, right? It, it was going to be so tough for him to find a new program, go out there. And it's my belief reading between the lines, I was certainly going to welcome back. I, we, we've talked about this in the past. There, there's something about Spencer Petrus and his leadership qualities that Kirk Ferentz just can't quit him, right? We've all had that kind of relationship, right? They're just somebody that you can't quit. That's Kirk Ferentz right now in Spencer Peters. He can't quit the guy. And personally, I would love to see just a fresh start. Ah, he very well could be a great coach. He could be a great mentor. We hear about his leadership qualities, but there's so much baggage 
between the fan base and him in his three years as a starter. We know Cade McNamara is going to be the man next year, right? But even if he's the backup, and, and an injury happens, say, to McNamara, he goes out, he gets dinged up, whatever it is, he's got to sit out a series. Seeing Spencer Peach, it's just the negative energy that surrounded him, and you saw it in game one this year. And I warned you guys. I, I told you that was going to happen because I felt the temperature of the fan base and how bad it was with Spencer Petras. Come back as a grad assistant. You want to go that route? Absolutely. Yeah, it sucks your career comes to an end like that. And getting injured after getting the ov ovation that he did on senior day in Kinnick Stadium, had to feel great for him. And then to go out in that way, it's tough to swallow. I get it. But big picture for the program, for the fan base, boy, you want to help out? Sure. Just not wearing a Hawkeye uniform. Is that a bad thing to say? Maybe. It's at least where my feelings are right now. Wrapping things up on the other side, the Iowa Swarm versus the Iowa Athletic Department. Maybe some fences being mended, cooling just a little bit. We'll give you the details on that and what you can do to help out Iowa Swarm. That's all as we continue on Locked on Hawkeyes. Trent kind of back with you one final time here on Locked On Hawkeyes. Again, thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen each and every day. We're available on the podcast and on YouTube. Locked On Sports today, it's the biggest story around the sports world in 20 minutes or less. Instant reaction, game caps, and Locked On's take of the day. Locked On Sports today, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. As we wrap things up, a story that is certainly dominated the conversation here for us uh, throughout this week, and that is the Iowa Athletic Department and the back and forth with the Iowa Sport Collective. I've explained it to you. You can find all the information that is out there right now. Well, an email came through yesterday morning, late morning, from the Iowa Athletic Department. If you're a season ticket holder, I believe if you're an iClub member, even if you bought single-game tickets in the past, an email came through from the University of Iowa explaining Swarm with the video of Kirk Ferentz talking about Hey, help us out, donate to the Swarm, something that's happening across the country. These coaches talking about it. And it's something that Brad Heinrichs and the rest of the Iowa Swarm crew, that they wanted. Now, they didn't get ultimately exactly what they wanted because they would have loved to get the information of all these ticket holders and, and people that are the most important to donate to Iowa Swarm. But at minimum, maybe some mending of fences happening there. It feels like that's the route that it's going. Something that I said right away made the most sense. Third party, don't want to give out that information. It's against your terms and conditions. I get it. The whole Title IX scenario, that was whack. Talk about that here in just a moment. The easiest way to do this, Athletic Department sends an email on behalf of Iowa Swarm. That's exactly what happened. So I know a lot of you got that email, got the information, got to see the video from Kirk Ferentz. Very simple. What this is, this is paying for players. Let's be honest. That's what it is. NIL was never intended to be pay for play, but that's what it is. Now, the Iowa Swarm is doing a great job of doing things, quote unquote, the right way, right? There are components to it and two different entities from the charitable aspect, giving back to the community, helping out of the children's hospital and going through a bunch of nonprofits and doing things for them, which is great. But there's also the business component where you are a car dealership, you got a sandwich shop, whatever it is, and they will also hook you up. Hey, I would like to have Connor McCaffrey talk about my business. I would like to have Joe Labus come in and talk about that. I want to have Riel Woods come in and take me down on a, on a commercial because they think it'll be hilarious. Those kind of things, Iowa Swarm is also working with local businesses in order to make that a reality. So it's all the components that you want. It is the real NIL, name, image, and likeness, what it was intended for. And then the other component to it and the charitable aspect. Ultimately, it's getting players. Without Iowa Swarm, Cade McNamara would not be a Hawkeye. Eric Hall would not be committed to the Hawkeyes. We would not have those two guys coming in for Michigan in the transfer portal. It's the reality of where we are. Got to keep building it up. Got to keep donating. And the levels start 
19 bucks a month and work their way up as, as high as you want to go if you're financially able, but that's what it is. A couple hundred bucks a year, if you can afford it, and you believe that's something that's going to help Hawkeye Athletics, and it absolutely is, that's what you want to do. IowaSwarm.com is the place for that. We got Iowa, Kentucky coming up tomorrow. Want to see this team one final time. I'm excited for it. I'm sure a lot of people are out there. Iowa has to bounce back on Sunday on the hardwood and get a victory. Let's have a great weekend. We'll be back with you after the game on Saturday. We will recap the bowl game with an instant reaction podcast. We'll get that out to you in your feeds, hopefully shortly after that one. Going to be back at my parents. Uh, my sister's going to be visiting from Cleveland. She's coming home with the little baby, so we'll uh, see how quickly after the game we're able to make that happen. But we will have an instant reaction podcast for you after the game. Then on Sunday, we'll have another one. More than likely, late Sunday night into Monday morning, we'll have an instant reaction after the Penn State-Iowa basketball game. As close to a must-win as you're going to have on January 1st, Iowa has to find a way to bounce back. Going to get the offense going. We will get into that over the weekend. Let's have a weekend here. Let's get a couple Hawkeye victories. Let's get some positive feelings going. Let's end this football season on a high note. Hope it goes that way, no doubt about it. Thanks for joining us here on Locked On Hawkeyes and making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen each and every day. Again, your second listen, check out Locked On Sports Today with Peter Bukowski. He brings you the biggest stories from around the sports world in 20 minutes. Analy uh, instant analysts, opinions before anyone else gets out there with local and national experts and insiders from Locked On. It's Locked On Sports Today, available on YouTube and wherever you get podcasts. Have a good one. We're going to get this thing up and running again. Going to get our voices right. I mean, we got to do it. You saw me. If you're watching on YouTube, you saw me coughing here throughout the... That's where the pauses were. If you're the audio side, I had some coughs, right? We're working our way back. We're feeling better. We're, we're hacking up the last of it. We're going to be positive. We're going to have a great weekend. Go Hawks. We'll talk to you again on Saturday.